Hello again tonight. Uh, the topic is science is no longer visible. Now, um, yes, it's kind of a clickbaity title, but uh, we'll get into that. So the uh, this YouTube channel is not monetized currently, and uh, YouTube always seems to be altering their algorithm for what to present to you on your watch list. So to get people to watch what might be uh, about a one hour long video, even at uh, 1.5x speed, I take out a lot of gaps to make it even shorter, audio gaps and such. You might notice that as jumps, but uh, it's to remove just dead spots in the audio. Pauses. Poignant pauses, me going with ums and things. But the first thing I have to do is to get you to even want to click on the video to start watching it. So you can think of, well, the title is The Foot in the Door. The good news is I'm not trying to sell any products or services or convince you that the sky is falling or anything like that. The bad news for the channel is that well, before we get to the end, you'll know what it's all about and feel free to stop viewing early. But for now, I'm just looking for somebody to think, yes, yes, go on, tell me more, even if only subliminally. So a long time ago, science used to be readily apparent. People looked at things that were around them and would want to understand what's really going on. Maybe they can use something to their advantage. Think a long, long time ago, but in this galaxy, not far, far away. A rock is heavy. Maybe I can use the heaviness of the rock to help me with something like, you know, hold something down, hold something in place, make a good foundation. So rock is heavy. I don't need to understand gravity or physics or inclined planes. I just need to know. It's a nice, solid, heavy thing. I can use of that, make use of that. If something rolls, like a boulder I can make roll, rolling seems to require less effort than dragging things along the ground so maybe uh, a wheel is a good thing so you can see that science was not recognized as science or there is a legitimate scientific process it was just people seeing things all around them and then wanting to know if they could make use of them like lightning sets a tree on fire oh maybe the ability to burn things on demand to create fire is something useful for other stuff like heating or boiling or cooking or lighting the cave. It was easy. The stuff was all around you. No one was going to control whether you wanted to play with it or understand it or not. Just have at it. While there weren't a lot of people on the planet, there were enough people on the planet that the odds on coming to an understanding of heaviness and wheels rolling and fire burning and making fire and such, um, the odds are pretty good that somebody on the planet's going to do it and they're going to show it to others. So all of it was pretty much in your face, didn't require a lot of tools, no analysis, not a lot of really prior education. You didn't need to know how chemistry works in order to make fire. So you didn't even have to have the ability to read because if you learned how to do something, it was passed on verbally. But it was short, easy stuff. You didn't have to listen to somebody like myself giving you a boring lecture for an hour plus. That was not a prerequisite to understanding it. You could just do it. And it was easily repeatable. And people could teach people how to do it. And there was nobody stopping you or you know, convincing you that it's not going to work. Science was easy. And it was visible all around you. So then we came up with something that was a little more difficult. So if reproducing a, an effect was useful, then understanding why it did what it did might make it even more useful. People not only wanted to reproduce an effect, they wanted to know why. So if, if you wanted to understand the underlying principles and it required some prior knowledge, you might have to write that down. You might have to document it for others. And you could use the written word to broaden the understanding. So, you know, things could work on top of other things. Like, you know, if you have a ball that rolls down a straight declining ramp, if I make the ramp sort of wavy and I make peaks and valleys in it, the ball rolling down that Ripley track rolls at a different time than the other one going straight down. And that was meaningful because if you want to create something that would move material goods down a ramp, if you made it kind of a, a bit of a cliffhanger ramp, they would get to the bottom sooner. So that was valuable. But to communicate that to someone else who communicates it to someone else who communicates it to someone else, you probably had to write that down so you could pass it on because you weren't going to be there when it was eventually going to be passed on. 
But if you write it down, it means that the people you want to make use of it need to understand what you wrote. So they have to have the ability to read and read in your language in order for the for the concept, for the principles to be passed around and to be acceptable. But now you've moved to a new plateau. There are now prerequisites to comprehension of this new science, which made it more difficult because you couldn't just see it around you and make it happen. You had to maybe go read something, which means you had to be able to read. You had to be able to read maybe a foreign language. Popularizing that newfound science to the general masses had constraints on it. They were not purposeful in their constraining. They just were. So understanding was not readily apparent. It wasn't all around you. If you wanted to demonstrate something like this, you may have to create a tool, something to measure it, something to reproduce the effect, things that you wouldn't have in everyday life. So hurdles. And then, of course, we had the other thing that was holding us back, which was people deliberately hindering the process. So, you know, prerequisite knowledge and reading is one thing. But if you had somebody in authority that didn't understand what you were talking about, didn't comprehend it, maybe couldn't read all that well, but they were in charge and they didn't agree with it, didn't find it acceptable, or even worse, found out that this new thing being communicated was not in their favor. It might reduce their control over the masses. So the progression of this science stuff had to be hindered. So those in authority labeled this newfound stuff as mysterious, something to at least be doubted, if not feared. And the people that were communicating it, be afraid of them even more so. So they identified the people who practiced this new science as outcast, maybe even illegal practitioners. And uh, there might even be a punishment for the illegal practitioners, um, or even just communicating it. You might risk your freedom or even your life. You might be imprisoned. Remember, Galileo was under home confinement for the back half of his life. You might up, wind up uh, going into jail or a dungeon. Or if you're um, preaching the wrong stuff, you might even be killed on sight or just to make everybody else not do what you're doing. You might be burned at stake at the stake in a public square. Or just if they were polite enough, they might just expel you from the community, never to return. Go away. We don't want to hear any of your 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 mystical arts stuff, your sciencey things. If there's an effect that requires prerequisite comprehension and acceptance, then if you kill the messenger, you can kill the message but only so long as you don't control everything everywhere. Because if the word gets out outside of your sphere of influence, then everybody on the outside will learn the new thing and will slowly come back into your community and go, the king has no clothes. Because what we're hearing on the outside is the king has no clothes. And eventually your authority will cave in. So if you doubt that this sort of hindering was once a threat, Learn more history. Galileo is a good example. If you doubt that it's currently possible that science denial is not something, then I guess you've never heard of the people that don't believe that we landed on the moon, flat earthers, or climate change denial. It's not the whole of the population, just some people. But even science can have hits and misses. If you don't know enough and all you know is what you know, then if you try and make a judgment on something you don't know about, you can actually have a big miss. Back in the day before we understood nuclear fusion, or even fission, it was stated that the sun was a giant bonfire. And when somebody pointed out, where'd the trees come from for the bonfire? Oh, they're not really trees, it's coal, it's coal. But then people went, okay. And nobody ever asked, where'd the coal come from? And why doesn't it eventually burn out pretty quickly? You know, if, if you ever even had a large pit fire of wood or coal, maybe a couple of days and it's all burnt to ash. The sun's been around for as long as all my family lineage has known the sun has been around. So where is it getting all the wood and the coal? Well, you know, if the only explanation you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. So if the only explanation you have is combustion in air, then... The only way the sun can burn for that long is if it's got a lot of wood or a lot of coal. That's just what they had. So if you have the facts that you know 
and you extrapolate them to explain what you don't know, you could be standing on shaky ground. At least today, when we have things that we don't know, they might be confusing to some, but we label them as dark, as in we can't detect them. We can detect them indirectly, maybe, like neutrinos, um, but we may not be able to have instruments that directly detect them. I don't know, like uh, photons whose wavelength is so long and the energy level is so low, it falls below the excitation chemistry of all of our sensors. And there's a lot of stuff out there that we just can't detect. Maybe that's dark matter. Maybe that's dark energy. We won't know until we do know. But remember, there were things at one time that we didn't know were there until we thought about it and came up with the conclusion that maybe something's there and we created instruments to measure them, like infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma. Those are not visible to the human eye. Back in the time, if they were using our current philosophies with science, we would describe how things get hot when there's no fire as dark heat, because you could put a thermometer down there, and uh, when you broke the light by the prism into multiple colors, there was a spot down below any color you could see that the temperature rose. So there was dark heat, but we eventually called that infrared because it's below red. But you know, there, there are other things too. Before we could even transmit in radio frequencies, we knew that there's energies out there that are in this band well below infrared. And um, once we realized we could transmit in it, we also needed the ability to receive in it. So uh, we had radio. But then we went to tune specific frequencies like unused AM dial frequencies. We got all this static. And we eventually realized that the static was the cosmic microwave background that's been around for billions of years. But until we created receivers of radio emissions, we never knew it was there. And it's been there since before we realized it was there. And it's been there ever since. You sometimes have to create a tool to realize that something is there that you never detected previously. And even what you can detect, your instruments may not be good enough. Remember when we had film cameras and we thought that the Andromeda thing was a nebula, the great Andromeda nebula. And then once we had better imaging, we went, wait a minute, I can see individual pinpoints of light, like we can see in the Milky Way. This thing that we thought was a nebula is actually another galaxy. And then as we created higher resolution, increased sensitivity sensors, we found out that it's not millions of stars that are in the Milky Way. It's not even a billion stars. It's hundreds of billions of stars just in our galaxy. And there's many, many billions of other galaxies. As you improve your sensor technology, you may find that a little is a lot. And remember, there's a difference between invention and discovery. You might invent a sensor, but then using your new sensor, you might discover something that's always been there. And there's a lot more of this stuff yet to come. So keep looking. So a couple hundred years ago, we, we progressed science into the realm of subatomic. Atoms became organized as units of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And eventually we broke even those for their part. We decomposed protons and neutrons into different kinds of quarks and gluons. And then we discovered these things called neutrinos that were the leftovers from stellar fusion. And then we found out, wait a minute, there's not just one kind of them, there's different kinds of them. And the different kinds of them were nothing more than just different energies of this class of things called neutrinos. And for something to have different energies, it's gotta have different mass. It's a very, very small mass. We took neutrinos from being massless and then corrected ourselves and went, well, if they've got flavors and different values, you've got to have some kind of mass. So neutrinos went from massless to not massless anymore. And that's been like in a lifetime. But there are things in science that whether you doubt them or not, you know, you, you can doubt protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, and gluons. It's just all too small. And, you know, I can't hold up a baseball and see the atoms in it. So why should I believe in it? Well, nuclear weapons, big bada boom bombs that obviously are undeniable. If you look back to the history of the end of the, the Second World War and the uh, Cold War until we 
came up with treaties to ban the detonation of them. And, um, you know, you can deny subatomic physics all you want, but you can't deny that nuclear weapons exist. It's just matter of fact, in your face, it's just, it is. So, you know, it's something that you might want to deny, but they exist. So you just have to accept that. But you also know that you don't know enough to fully understand them as an average individual. And you don't want to go through all of the education necessary to learn and know about it and get a good confidence level. But what you do expect is all of the people you put into leadership roles, they know how to go deal with that stuff. So, you know, we have the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, and you go, oh, I, I can sleep at night knowing that they're on the watchdog to see when other countries are switching on nuclear devices or detonating nuclear weapons or on the verge of that. And I feel I feel safe that, you know, there's at least somebody looking out for us, the individual, the, the general population. And then I've got an administra administration that believes we ought to spend money to have that Atomic Energy Commission do their job. I like that. But some people may not make the connection that I like the Atomic Energy Commission, but that Department of Energy, I, I don't know why we need that, because the Atomic Energy Commission sits underneath the Department of Energy. And if you get rid of the Department of Energy, you get rid of the Atomic Energy Commission. Never mind. So there have been advances in electronics in your automobile, in your mobile phone, that you have mobile phones, aerodynamics, electronics, jet-powered airplanes, the internet, cloud-based computing, the unleashing of all of this, uh, you know, electron-based stuff, uh, and the material science associated with it, um, is just in your everyday life nowadays. And they're undeniable. So you, you can deny some of these underlying physics principles, but if you go out and you buy yourself a smartwatch that you really like the fact that when you flip your wrist over the display comes on and you really like that you may not may not have any clue that subatomic physics is the reason why it does that without having to have like a little rattling ball and a, a magnet and a coil and stuff in there you know you're using the principles of subatomic physics without needing to comprehend them there's nothing you have to read about mems chips to know that you can go buy a laptop or a mobile phone or a uh, watch and it just works but if you're going to deny the science and then go buy yourself one of these devices you're you're not a hypocrite you're just denying the mere existence of something that you actually are making use of science went to the somewhat not there you, you can't look at your your smart watch and see the mems chip inside of it unless you disassemble it and then it won't work anymore so you just accept the fact that there's some magic in there that makes that happen. And now we're in the quantum era. So we've gone down below the subatomic physics, and now we're into effects that even now, not all of the scientific community fully understands it. They just know that it's weird. It's probabilistic. And we need more money to create more tools to research the effects and you know, how many billions can we spend on quantum computers and things like that? But um, if you doubt that these things actually work, uh, as uh, Einstein was often misquoted as saying, spooky action at a distance, entanglement is something that exists. You can deny it all you want, but it exists. And there are Nobel Prizes based upon us having things that make use of quantum effects to measure things that we could not measure before. There was recently a Nobel Prize awarded for attosecond physics. And if you think about measurements of time, you know that a nanosecond is a billionth of a second. And then you have femtoseconds, which are a thousandth of a billionth. And then you have a thousandth of a, a, of a, a femtosecond, and that's a picosecond. And then you have a thousandth of a picosecond which is an attosecond. These are things that can only be measured through detection mechanisms. There is no human physiology that can get anywhere near close to understanding the duration of an attosecond. But things that we once took for granted as, 
it's instantaneous. It just happens. You know, the electron moves from this shell in the atom to this shell in the atom. It's just, it happens instantaneously. Well, now that we can actually take measurements using quantum effects at the attosecond level, we can actually see the electron getting energized, starting to ramp up its velocity, move towards the outer part of the atom, and then attain that shell layer, and then go, I've got too much to fit in here. I need to eject some. It ejects the photon, and then it like makes a mad dash, accelerating back down to a lower level where it can feel stable, where it's at rest again. So what we originally thought was, it goes from here to here, and it just happens instantaneously. Is now like, oh, wait a minute, the energy comes in, the photon is absorbed, and the electron starts making its way to the out. And he gets there and he goes, oh, I, I don't really feel good out here. I, I don't fit in with the rest of the electrons. The shell's too full. And, and then starts coming back in towards the center. And the speed out and the speed in are different. So as we start working the quantum effects, we start to realize that some of this stuff that we said, it's just probabilistic. It it's happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't happen. But it, it turns out that some of these probabilities aren't necessarily probabilities. They're more like something comes in from the outside to affect them. And they found this out with quantum computers and that they had qubits. These are the entangled subatomic particles that are the basis for switching the quantum computers. And sometimes the qubits would misbehave. They wouldn't come back with the value you expected from the algorithm you were running. Instead of it being a one, it was a zero. Instead of being a zero, it was a one. This was weird. And what they found out was, there's only so much isolation you can do with your liquid helium cooled core of your quantum computer. Sometimes there will be an energetic photon that makes its way through and strikes your quantum computer chip and causes one of your qubits to go flip polarity. So the probabilistic becomes random. So now you can do one of two things. You can find better shielding. So the effect is less pronounced and the probability changes. The Large Hadron Collider. I hear there's a proposal to make it even bigger. And all they're going to do is, you know, if the instruments are here in this part of the ring and the ring is this size, they'll make the ring bigger and keep the instruments in the same place. The tunnel would have to be like multi-level and they'd have to steer the beam up and down. The even larger Hadron Collider. And, you know, we're going to be building this uh, laser interferometer in space called LISA that there has to be millions of kilometers between individual uh, laser measuring devices. And they're going to have to measure the distance between themselves using lasers at a certain wavelength. And as, you know, LIGO did, they're, they're going to have to measure down to a uh, fraction of the diameter of a proton because that's how things change. But in order to do that, NASA had to come up with a LISA test vehicle. You know, if, if, I could, if, if I need it millions of kilometers apart, maybe if I put something in Earth orbit that is only you know 100 kilometers apart, I can prove that the lasers will actually do this stuff. So they had to create the three satellites that then they launched into Earth orbit to prove that the laser interferometry in space was actually something they could do. But the general public only sees the end product. Right now, they can measure gravity waves, but what's that got to do with the average person? Uh, nothing, because gravity waves like the neutrinos just pass right through you, and you never even notice they were there. But there are some things that we have yet to even make practical, like fusion power plants, uh, room temperature ambient pressure superconductors. We're still working on both those things. They may take even longer than we've ever thought possible. Or maybe, some, maybe somebody will crack it one day, but you got to keep researching. You got to keep investing the money in it. If you deny it too early on because you don't have the vision to perceive what it could ultimately do or be, then you pull the money out too soon. You'll never get there. Like a certain quantity of photons at a certain wavelength can transfer sufficient momentum to move things around that have a greater than subatomic mass. So what I'm talking about is 
In 2018, there was a Nobel Prize in physics for optical tweezers because nobody would believe the team that was working on this. They had to actually make one and show it moving things in an electron microscope before anybody would believe that a puny little infrared laser could actually move bacteria and virus cells around. And now it can. So connect the dots, scale it up. Get more energy per photon. Get a lot more photons. What's denying it from moving larger things? Maybe we'll start by just moving um, atoms of chemical compounds around. You know, nudge things together that normally wouldn't couple. But once you get them close enough together, the um, subatomic forces will click the molecule into place, whereas by itself it wouldn't. Or um, we know that wavelengths can be uh, reduced, stretched towards the red, uh, but we never connect the dots and go, how about we use the same effect to make that infrared light into radio light and then into light we can't detect as radio? You know, it's kind of an inevitability, but nobody's willing to even connect the dots at this point. Or as we showed last week in the presentation, maybe it's possible through magnetic field effects, Bremstra lung, um, that you can create photons that can't be created through exciting atoms. But that's where we are right now is some things that might, but there's doubt and so nobody's, or very few people are doing it. So what's next after this? Let's look out even further in the future. Some of the things that we think is foundational, like conservation of stuff, turns out may not always be the case. It's, I, I liken it to... Uh, you know, we had Newtonian gravity, and everybody was happy with that. It worked. We could do spacecraft. And then this guy Einstein came along and said, no, 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 no. Gravity works like this. It's just bending of space-time. Okay, well, both effects are still in existence. You know, if you drop an apple, nobody says, that's relativity. They say it's Newtonian physics. But if you go and start working with subatomic particles, and you bend them and the timing changes, uh, aha, that's Einsteinian. Or if you have GPS satellites, that the, the measurement of your distance on the ground isn't quite right. Wait a minute, the satellites are doing, you know, 19 plus thousand miles an hour in orbit. Did we take into account the relativistic speed? Oh, look, it's now down to 25 feet. So, you know, both concepts of gravity still work. They're still valid. You just use them under different circumstances. So it, it may be that a lot of the things that we think of as instantaneous, like electrons moving around in shells within an atom, are not instantaneous. They're just faster than currently measurable. And as we get to quantum effects allowing us to measure things that we couldn't normally measure because they're too small, we may find that some of the things that we have prescribed limits on, like Planck length and Planck time and Planck energies, aren't really limits. We just don't have the technology to get any smaller. But that's that's you know down the road a ways. But in the meantime, we have this thing called the James Webb Space Telescope, and it's coming up with all these observations that are beyond the uh, foundational limits. We're finding things that are too small. Uh, that's too small to be a planet. Um, that's too small to be a star. How did it turn on? Um, that's too small to be a neutron star, or black holes can't be that small. And then you flip it the other way and you go, well, that's too big to be a star or a planet or, or quark stars, what are those? And that's too big to be a black hole, it should have shredded itself by now. Or you have things that are too short, like quantum computer qubits, or the top quark is the most massive subatomic particle we have, but it's so short-lived that you can't possibly have a top quark star. Well, when we find them, um, it'll be surprising. And then somebody will say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And then when you find three of them, there's still some doubt because you're standing on top of a foundational precept that was not as solid as you thought it was to begin with. The latest one that I saw was Sabina Hassenfelder had a uh, video that described towards the end of it, chaos and complexity might be nothing more than we need better nonlinear differential math. 
that some of the things that we think of are chaos are nothing more than we're not taking into account the smallest possible effects. The, the, the butterfly effect causing a problem for something at a very large scale in another country. So we may find that chaos and complexity are just, we've never measured them down that small. We might also find that um, enormous galaxy scale effects are nothing more mysterious than infinitesimally small effects on a very enormous scale. And that's how you get things like dark matter, dark energy, the Higgs field, or eventually gravitons. We may also find that these fields impose limits on other things that we measure, like the speed of light may simply be the limitation as imposed by the uh, universal Higgs field. How to go faster than light? Stop light from being limited. But believing in all of it may be beyond current science practitioners. Um, you may need to find science-minded individuals that um, are more accepting of what might be new postulations to be proven. And you might find that the entrenched scientific community become your next deniers, your next um, people standing on shaky ground. Or as I like to say, you'll never know how much you didn't know until you know what you didn't know. So in conclusion, hundreds of years ago, science readily apparent. Um, anyone can get involved. Anyone had the tools for the analysis. Then it became something that had to be analyzed and documented and passing it on to others meant somebody had to be able to read the documentation that led to making it no longer readily apparent and uh, not everybody could do it. And uh, it got labeled as mysterious, magical, and mystic arts practitioners and put them away or you know, expel them from the community and you know, kill the messenger. And that, that way we can stay where we are now. If you couldn't read, then it was easy for you to deny something. But nowadays, it's kind of hard to deny something when it's in a product that you use every day, like your mobile phone or your wristwatch. And uh, the tools that we need nowadays are beyond the wallets of the masses. So even myself two weeks ago was saying, I wish I could generate a semiconductor that would work this way, but I don't have the money to make that happen. So maybe by me posting a video and somebody working at one of these large foundries will go, we've got some spare cycles. Why don't we make a MIMS chip that can do that and see what happens? But we have social media now. And even if somebody doesn't comprehend the science, doesn't understand what's going on, they can very easily and cheaply have a loud enough voice to overshout the scientific community as a denier and say, nope, doesn't exist, can't possibly happen, or just doubt what's factual. But to have a science denier publicly denounce something on a social media platform, while at the same time, they're doing so using their mobile phone to video record themselves, or you see them wearing like their smartwatch. It's like, it's like somebody today driving an electric vehicle and not knowing anything about what's going on inside the electronics and just professing their lack of knowledge. And they've got to go back to their internal combustion engine vehicle that also has a computer in it that they don't understand what's going on. That if it broke, they just have to take it to the dealership. Be careful of what you deny. <laughs> okay, so like I said, it would be a little shorter than usual. And I only have one slide worth of links, but it's a lot of background stuff that you can read about. There were actually two books that came out. There was a book called The Death of Science, and there was another book that preceded it called The Twilight of the Scientific Age. All they were trying to say was, the easy science has already been discovered. The harder science is not going to be something that everybody's going to pick up on. It's going to be something that would require you to have some educational background to even understand what the hell people are talking about. So the general public won't pick up on it, but they can deny it right up until they go buy some mass-produced product that makes use of the technology. But I also found out that there's this thing called the Millennium Prize, it's a series of mathematical problems that still exist. And the mathematical problems are given like the names of the guys that first stated, this is the problem in math and I can't solve it. I've not found, any, found anybody else that solved it. And they even had one of them that somebody thought they solved, but not for all cases. So they had to leave it on the list. And they're willing to pay big money if somebody can come up with the sol solutions, come up with the math to solve these problems and then have other people peer review it and conclude, oh my gosh, 
that person's actually solved the problem. Give him the million dollar prize. <laughs> and for those that believe that science is not in denial, um, you can go read the Pew Research Survey where, yeah, yeah, it is in denial. And the number of people denying science that are contemporary, you know, not really old people, they're younger or middle-aged people that are denying certain things in science. And then they're making use of the, the things that make use of that science. So not that they're hypocrites, they're deniers of something that's right in their face. Be careful of what you deny. You may be your own proof to it not being in denial. Okay, comments, questions? I didn't give any math, so. I recently watched, I recently rewatched uh, Bill Nye debating <laughs> Ken Ham, and it, it <laughs> your your talk tonight really uh, reflects that quite well. It was it was horrifying to watch that. <laughs> yes, I I watched a few of those kinds of debates, and they're not really debates. They're no the the scientific community will operate in a principled manner trying to debate something. And the person on the other side is not operating as a skilled debater. They're operating as someone who believes in what they believe in, and you're never going to change their mind. And okay, so the person obeying the scientific practices is never going to change their mind. And the person who believes in what they believe in and is a denier, despite evidence to the contrary right in front of their face, they're never going to change their mind. So it's, you know, they're an impasse and neither side's going to change. So I, I watch those for a few moments. And when I see the rut that they're getting in and neither side's going to change that, okay, I'll stop watching it now. Don't argue with a rock. The rock will always win. Because <laughs> it's a rock. <laughs> yeah. But I do, I do think that one of the reasons why Science is everywhere, engineering, math, physics, chemistry. The disciplines are all out there. They're all in practice in the products we use. And because the application of them actually makes the products more capable, faster, cheaper, easier to produce, that that's not going to stop. Science is going to progress. Whether people deny it or not, whether people understand it or not, is not really relevant. It'll still progress because it makes the big bucks. So ah. it'll progress. But it is getting more difficult. You have to know more. You have to have like more discipline or a larger group of people with specialists. And, and then you get started and you might go down a couple of rabbit holes while you're researching it, like I often do. And they're, you know, sometimes they're dead ends. Sometimes they're proven, but they're just not applicable. Uh, like I was looking at uh, Bremsterlung last week and thought maybe there's another term for this when magnetic fields rather than protons are decelerating the electrons. And I went looking for it and I found this thing called Tyndall scattering and I didn't know about it. So I had to go read about it to realize that, nope, not that. So sometimes, you know, cause I already understood Rayleigh scattering from astronomy. Sometimes you, you have to go learn more only to find out that's not what you needed to know. You know, you'll go down a rabbit hole wasting a lot of time and if you get the right people together that know this stuff, that have the experience, then you won't waste as much time. You won't waste That's as true. much money. Yeah. You have to waste a lot of time to go the wrong way. <laughs> yes. Dead ends are expensive. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if you go out and you, you know, what, what was the old, uh, there was a, a um, neutrino detector that was off the Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean. And they submerged it out at sea thinking it wouldn't have any outside influences if it was a couple of hundred feet below the surface in salt water oh and then's when they realize metal in salt water corrodes <laughs> and that's an electrical action an electrical action on metal can produce a magnetic <laughs> field <laughs> and so their neutrino detector which didn't directly ne detect neutrinos had a problem but they spent who knows how many millions of dollars creating this neutrino detector that kind of just wasn't up to the snuff. And so they created a new neutrino detector in the Antarctic by burying the detectors in ice. So they would use heated lances to make 
holes, deep holes, you know, a couple hundred feet down holes in the ice, and they would quickly drop a string of uh, sensors on a, a cable spaced at a known distance apart into the hole, pushing the water out, and then they would just let them sit there. And given that it's ice around the hole, the water would freeze over again and hold the sensors at whatever distance they've left them at. So they could do this, and after 168 uh, holes, they had their first generation sensor array. And after, I think it was close to two years, they finally tuned the electronics and the software enough where they could start to indirectly detect neutrinos. And they did. And then they detected more of them. And then they realized, oh, there's some things that we have to discount, like muons in the Earth's atmosphere coming in and creating like localized neutrinos. No, no, we want the distant neutrinos, not the localized ones. So they had to create filters, and then the detection count went down. But they can still detect remote neutrinos. But they spent a lot of money doing that, and they want to make it bigger. And they were told they could add a certain number additional neutrinos. They couldn't create like a whole new array. They could only add in more sensors. But the folks that did the cheapest neutrino detector um, were in Mexico. Giant freshwater tanks, giant, you know, polyurethane, hard shelled tanks of fresh water. And they put them out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, there might be 50 tanks of water. And they put the neutrinos inside, the neutrino detectors inside there. And they work fine <laughs> and cost a lot less money. And they can expand them a lot bigger. And if they get the array big enough, then they can measure what direction the neutrinos are coming from. So sometimes even your best laid plans of the better detector can be superseded by people thinking outside the box and making a cheaper detector. But you never know until you try. Oh. Okay. Well, that's it. Well, thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, y'all. I'm going to stop recording now.